Hi. So I want to start by asking you a simple question. By a show of hands, I would like to know who among you has ever come across a stranger that you wished you could talk to? Show of hands, yeah. Who are you? What are you doing? Where are you going? What's your life like? Hold on, hold on. Keep your hands up. Now, I can't really see very far in the room, but it looks like most of you raised their hands. Right, okay. So I'm not the only curious one in the room. And hold on. Keep your hands up again. <laughs> now, what I want to know is, of those who raise their hands, who actually asks any of these questions to strangers? There's, oh, there's a few hands left. That's good. But as I see how few hands are left up in the air, well, I can't help but remember what my parents used to tell me when I was a kid. Ne parle pas aux inconnus. Don't talk to strangers. And as we grow up, it seems as though we don't really forget what our parents have told us. And I mean, why should we? Why should I? What could I possibly gain from talking to strangers anyway? You see, two years ago, I had a pretty good job in an advertising agency. I was making fairly decent money, and I had great career opportunities ahead of me. I also had a girlfriend, a very close circle of friends, and a loving family. So I had everything I wanted, and I had everyone that I needed. So what did I need strangers for? I thought I had it all, but still, I felt like something was missing. And for the longest time, I could not figure out what it was. But I found the beginnings to what might be an answer, well, on a blog called Humans of New York. Uh, for those who don't know Humans of New York, I'll say Honey for short. It's the project of a photographer called Brandon Stanton, who takes pictures of random people he meets in the streets of New York. And he tries to find out stories about them. So he walks up to someone, asks, can I take a picture of you? Okay, cool. And now I'm going to ask you a few very personal questions. Can you tell me what your greatest struggle in life is? Can you share your happiest memory? What about the saddest one? Can you tell me what your biggest regret in life is? And so on. And the exciting thing about this blog is that people actually answer him. So people he's never met before share with him stories that are personal and oftentimes moving and inspiring. If you compare this to what we tend to do on a daily basis, uh, <laughs> I mean, we spend so much time looking down on our phones that we have kind of forgotten how to look up and into people's eyes. And when we talk through our computers and tablets and phones, well, we're not really being ourselves. We're not really communicating who we are. We're presenting what we think is the best version of who we are. And as a great American philosopher, Lady Gaga, uh, brilliantly <laughs> puts it, <laughs> when we're doing this, we're not communicating with each other. Unconsciously, we're communicating lies. And two years ago, I was a social media consultant in the advertising world. So my job was basically to encourage these sorts of superficial connections. I was part of the problem, and I needed to become part of the solution. So inspired by Brandon, I quit my perfect job. I bought myself a camera. And with my two good friends, Thibaut Caron and Samuel Rochelot, we created Portraits of Montreal, the Montreal adaptation of Humans of New York. Now this here is one of the first persons I've photographed as part of the project. Let me ask you, what do you think this man does for a living? What do you think his job is? Don't be shy, give me an ID, someone. A barman? Yeah, I get that all the time. Something? An architect? A painter. All right, you got some interesting ideas, but here's what he actually told me his job was. <laughs> I know, right? That man massages dogs for a living. How cool is that? <laughs> now, here's the story that he told me. Uh, the first dog he massaged was at the SPCA. Uh, she was named Stella. She had been rescued from a puppy mill. Uh, so she had been beaten all of her life, and she was terrified of men. But after 20 minutes of massaging Stella, she fell asleep on his lap. And he was so profoundly moved to have had that positive impact on Stella that then and there he decided to quit his acting career to pursue well, full-time canine massage therapy. So at a traffic light, in a few minutes, this man that I had never seen before in my life shared with me a story that was personal and which I found moving and, in a way, inspiring. So I felt amazing when I said goodbye, and little by little, I gained the confidence to approach more people, different people, older people, and younger people. People, uh, street artists, and businessmen. People from different cultures, and people of different religions. I approached dog people, and cat people, <laughs> ferret people, and even snake people, little people, and giants. 
people with one leg and people with three, people on four wheels and people on one, people who seemed to have it all and people who had lost it all. I even met a real life superhero and I was lucky enough that I ran into a biblical one. Now, eventually, I was so confident in this that I was even approaching the people that I was honestly a little bit afraid of. You know? But I realized that with a genuine smile, there was no one that wouldn't talk to me. Everyone is approachable, even gang members. Now, <laughs> hold on, these guys said to me, now we're not the Hells Angels, we're the Hells Imers. <laughs> Funny guys, yeah. This man here is named, uh, is called Michel Pépin. When I met Michel, he told me about a dream of his. He wanted to do an exhibition where would be displayed photographs of his day-to-day -day life. So he asked me, this is on our first encounter, would you come to my house one morning, as I'm just waking up, I'll be still naked and in my bed, and you can take pictures of me in my morning routine. How can you say no to that? Eh? <laughs> now you see, Michel has multiple sclerosis, so his morning routine is, well, fairly different from ours. Many steps require the help of a caregiver, such as stretching before getting out of bed, showering, putting his urine bag on, getting dressed, and even going to the bathroom. Now, what I didn't tell you is that Michel is a poet, and the three books he's uh, probably showing off here are his. He self-published three poetry books. And for the past seven years, up until last uh, winter, Michel has been going out on the street every day to give away his poems in exchange for whatever people would give him. More than the few dollars he would make, it's really the connection with people that he was after. He just loved to put a smile on someone's face. He would also put a smile on his, and the whole thing was liberating to him. Now, poetry isn't the most popular art form these days, so every once in a while, Michel would run into someone who would tell him they should go get a job, and you know the type. And that's why he wanted to show people his hardship. He wanted to show them what he was going through so that they wouldn't be so quick to judge him. Because as he beautifully puts it, I'm going to quote like a tiny bit of his poetry here. If I'm disturbing you with my differences, sorry. I do not know any other way to be happy than to be me. The images I took were meant to be displayed alongside his poems. His failing body displayed alongside his thriving creativity. So we paired some of my pictures with some of his poems and we started exhibiting our work in the streets. We got a chance to be a part of a collective art exhibit until eventually a restaurant saw what we were doing and generously invited us to host our very own public exhibit for a month. Michel titled the exhibit, Surely You've Noticed, I'm a Poet. By exhibiting the most intimate parts of his life, Michel help, had helped us see beyond the crippled man. He showed us that there is beauty beyond the ugliness, that there is strength beyond the weaknesses. He, so, he showed us that there is light, even in the darkest places. And by doing so, he taught us a very valuable lesson. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Humans are like icebergs. Your eyes can only ever reveal the tip of who they really are. And so we can never trust a first impression of someone. This is David. My first impression of David was that he looked like a junkie and was probably in need of a fix. And because of that, I almost walked past him and didn't go talk to him. But I did, and boy, I'm glad I did, because here's what I found out. David had indeed been a heroin addict for most of his life, but when I met him, he had been clean for two years. And he had lost his apartment only six months before, because he had spent all of his savings, he had sold all of his furniture and everything he owned, and he had nothing left to pay his rent. Everything he had, he spent for one reason, to get two tumors removed from his dog, Diamond. Yep, it turns out it was this man's devotion to his dog that had gotten the best of him, not the drugs. And David too told me about a dream of his. His dream was simple enough. He just dreamed not to spend the winter in the street because you see, this is where David was living back then, in a cardboard shack he had built for himself in a back alley right in the heart of downtown Montreal, actually just a couple blocks away from here. So we shared David's story on Portrait to Montreal, and soon after, we received a pretty cool email. It said something like, hi, uh, can I wire you $200, and you go and buy David and Diamond some food? Wow, that's cool. There's something that can be done here. We saw an opportunity. So we launched a crowdfunding campaign, and a few weeks later, it's uh, 164 people who had donated over $6,000, which allowed us, well, to get David and Diamond 
off the streets and into an apartment. For those who've never seen so I find a lease, this is what it looks like in Quebec. <laughs> Now, once people had heard David's story, they couldn't just ignore him anymore. He wasn't just a bum now. He was a human being. He deserved to be helped. They felt something for him. Opening ourselves to the stories of people has the direct consequence of making us feel empathy. It makes us feel connected to each other. It makes us want to help one another. And I thought that was important, so I wanted to continue in that direction. And I started reaching out to well, all the people that are invisible to most, the same ones that need our help the most. And I uncovered their stories too. I met men who had lost everything they had, job, wife, house, children. Others who were simply in between two jobs and struggling to make ends meet. I met a man who was slowly losing a fight against cancer. And another one who had lost one a long time ago against a bad depression. I met people who told me they found comfort in friendship. A man who found comfort in hugging anyone that would hug him. And I met a girl who found her comfort in good literature. I met a man who saved a soldier's life in a war. And another one who helped a woman give birth to her child. I met a girl who had to run away from an abusive stepdad when she was just a teenager. And a guy who had been struggling with alcohol and drug addiction since he was eight years old. I met this man who was really happy because he had been sober a few months and he was just about to turn his life around. Now, all of these men and women surprised me with a story that I could have never expected. And that really taught me one thing, never to trust my prejudice again. And you see, it's often because of prejudice that we don't talk to strangers. We, we convince ourselves that we know exactly what to expect of them, that there's nothing to find out. And that, well, even if there was, they wouldn't share it with us because they're a stranger to us, but we're a stranger to them. But now, I didn't force any of these people to tell me their stories. I just asked them, kindly, if they would, and they did. Now, I use my camera as a way to create opportunities to talk to people, but opportunities often come up on their own. Uh, anyone who has a dog, you've got tons of opportunity to talk to people. Anyone that goes, oh, he's so cute, what's the pooch name? You can talk to them. If you're riding the bus, there's always someone sitting right beside you. It, I know it feels awkward, but you can talk to them. In the beginning, when I asked whoever wished they could talk to a stranger, uh, most of you raise your hands. We all want to feel connected to people. It's part of who we are as human beings. It's part of our nature. So I say, let's stop fantasizing about it and start actually doing it. You would be surprised the things people are willing to share with you. So it's important that we give people a chance to surprise us. And more importantly, that we give ourselves a chance to be surprised. Now that's what I was missing before. And that's the greatest gift you can give yourself. Each of the people I've met, they've expanded the window from which I'm looking at the world. They made me richer, richer in emotions, richer in memories, richer in human connections. The only valuable kinds of wealth out there. Allowing myself a chance to be surprised by people made me a much happier person. And it got me new friends, David and Diamond, only to name a couple. It kicked off my career as a photographer. It got my work to be featured in the news. And you know what? It got me here on this stage today. I actually found out the other day that this TEDx conference is the result of two guys randomly meeting at the gym. Can you imagine that the bench press is going to be something like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if there was a TEDx conference at Concordia? <laughs> and here we are today. There's so much good that can emerge from a single connection that it's important when given the opportunity to talk to a stranger let it happen. Make it happen. Surprise yourself. Ask the questions you want to ask. Make a genuine connection. And you'll soon find out that there are no strangers, only friends we haven't met yet. Thank you. Thank you.